Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, we dive into the topic of auctions with guests Kshitij Kulkarni, a PhD student at Berkeley in the EECS department, and Matthias Fajeda, a postdoc at Harvard. Tarun is my co-host for this one, but he's also the co-author of most of the work that we cover. We share a history of auctions in the real world, in finance, in advertising, and in blockchain, and then explore how different types of auctions are used in these different scenarios. We then cover their newer work, built for more recent blockchain use cases, such as MEV and NFT auctions, and then look at the incentives of both auction holders and the participants, and how these designs might influence the effectiveness of the auctions themselves. In the last stretch of the episode, we look at how ZKPs are being incorporated into some of these designs, and how this might be an interesting new problem space to try out advanced cryptography in. Now, before we start, one of our sponsors for the upcoming ZK Summit 9 had a quick message. Jump Crypto is inviting all researchers, academics, and protocols to join them for ZK Week, happening in Chicago from May 15th to May 20th. Expect six full days of inspiring talks from top researchers, shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder collaborations, and plenty of opportunities to build meaningful relationships. Head over to jumpcrypto.com slash ZK Week to apply. We'll add the link in the show notes. And as mentioned, ZK Summit 9 is happening next week, as well as ZK Hack Lisbon, and so we won't be releasing an episode next week. We decided as a team to give ourselves a little pause so that we could focus on making those events amazing. If we don't see you there, then you will hear us back here on April 5th with our next episode. And now Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Alio is a new layer one blockchain that achieves the programmability of Ethereum, the privacy of Zcash, and the scalability of a rollup. If you're interested in building private applications, then check out Alio's programming language called Leo. Leo enables non cryptographers to harness the power of ZKPs to deploy decentralized exchanges, hidden information games, regulated stable coins, and more. Visit developer.alio.org to learn more. You can also participate in Alio's incentivized testnet 3 by downloading and running a Snark OS node. No sign-up is necessary to participate. For questions, join their Discord at alio.org forward slash Discord. So thanks again, Alio. And now, here's our episode. So today we're going to be exploring the concept of auctions in all of their forms with our guests, Kshitij Kulkarni, a PhD student at Berkeley in the EECS department and Mateus Fejera, postdoc at Harvard in the School of Engineering. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for having us. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very excited to talk about our work. The work we're going to be talking about today is entitled Credibility and Incentives in Gradual Dutch Auctions. This is work that the two of you wrote together with Tarun, who's also here. Hey, Tarun. Hey, everyone. All I have to say is, as both a, a host and a guest this time, in some ways, co-host and a guest, I'm excited to talk about this paper because somehow, you know, we, we haven't talked too much about like ZK applications. And I really feel like this is one of the first things that is in that vein that, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about because I've been on this podcast a lot. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So before we jump into this, let's learn a little bit about UK and Matthias. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Matthias, why don't you go first? Yes, I'm uh, currently a postdoc at Harvard. So before I did my PhD at Princeton in computer science. So in general, my research has been looking into aspects of security, uh, algorithmic economics, and cryptography. Uh, and I think uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain in general is a very exciting area to actually be combining these different aspects of computer science. So tell me a little bit about the kinds of work and research. Like what is the exact field of, st like what have you been working on? Yeah, so auction design has been one of the uh, areas I've been doing a lot of work. So I've been very interested on this aspect of designing credible auctions, which are essentially auctions where you cannot trust the auctioneer. Uh, so it's a very different take from traditional economics because often you assume the auctioneer is honest. Uh, honest they're going to yeah. commit to follow um, the auction they have promised to do. Uh, but in practice, 
uh, auctioneers might actually try to manipulate their auction uh, to increase revenue. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that has been a problem in, especially in the internet, because you don't, you really can't see if an auction is manipulating their own auction over the internet because it's, it's just a black box, right? The only thing you see is you're sending your bids and you're getting a quote of how much you need to pay. Um, and, and you really don't know what the auctioneer can be doing there. This is interesting. It's almost like you were just studying auctions, period, not necessarily like auctions in a blockchain context. But like, yeah, I first learned about these kinds of, I mean, I'd heard of about auctions generally, but I guess the first time I started looking into them was very much when they were being used back in 2017 for some of the like ICO token sales. That was the first time I started to see, and specifically these Dutch auctions. Mateus actually also spent a lot of time doing research on proof of stake attacks and um, attacks against transaction fee mechanisms like EIP-1559. So He's actually done a lot of other crypto-related research in his PhD. So I feel okay, like we should cool. shortchange some of that because it's actually <laughs> yeah. kind of relevant because we've talked about a lot of that in the show. Ah. Yes, yeah, so I can say more about it. So um, yeah, the way I might take it on that is I try to understand the different aspects of, of blockchain. So auctions I see as an application, but also incentives, they take a very important role on the layer one uh, blockchain. So something I've been very interested in is to understand when proof of stake blockchains are what we call incentive compatible, which means that when miners have incentive to actually follow the protocol, because when a designer basically creates a new protocol, they're basically telling what miners should do, but mm -hmm. you really have to incentivize them to actually do that. Uh, so I have done some work on, uh, how uh, on actually analyzing uh, protocols. One particular was the Algorand protocol, uh, where we under we try to understand the the incentives of the protocol, and and I have some other work where we try to design alternative uh, proof of stake protocols. They are incentive compatible, and as Tarun was saying, also in in the application lab when you start going more in the higher uh, levels of the stack. I have done some work on transaction fees. In particular, I got interested on that after the EAP 1559 uh, came around where I was basically trying to understand what would be the equilibrium properties of that protocol. And, and we had a, a paper on analyzing the EAP 1559 and actually proposing alternative designs for that. Cool. So Kay, let's hear a little bit about your background. What have you been working on? What led you to this problem? Yeah, so so roughly, I would sort of frame my PhD work uh, as sort of falling in the area of, of dynamic incentive design or dynamic mechanism design. So that, I'll just split those three words into you know, what they mean. So dynamic, something that's happening over time. So people are interacting with a mechanism or a, an incentive system over time. Um, and then, of course, incentive design is the problem of uh, sort of a social planner or a central planner trying to get some self-interested people or agents to do something that is good or something that you know as he wants. Yeah. Uh, and I've been also working with Turin recently after getting nerd sniped on this MEV problem. Ah. Um, and so re really got interested in these gradual Dutch auctions because they have sort of all of these properties that they're auctions that happen over time. Uh, and uh, there is this sort of very interesting problem, like how do you incentivize players in these auctions to to do well, as, as Mateus was saying, uh, to be incentive compatible, for the auction to be credible, uh, but now over time, instead of sort of in this one-shot context. Uh, so yeah, so that's what got me interested in this problem. The problem is sort of dynamic and happening over time and thought it was very interesting. Cool. Tarun, now I'm curious, how did you get to this problem? Where for you did auctions first pop up? Is it through MEV as well? Or is this something you've been tracking? I think, you know, when I was working in trading, um, I used to trade a lot of the opening auctions. And one of the things when I was doing that was, you know, maybe it's like 2014 or 2015, I spent a lot of time reading kind of books like Tim Roughgarden's 20 Lectures on Algorithmic Game Theory and um, Noam Nissan's like 
random books on like auction complexity and automated market makers actually by Santom and a couple others. And at that time, I was just trying to understand like how well the theory of what people had written in algorithmic game theory actually matched what people really do mm. when they're trading against auctions. So, you know, unlike crypto, most markets in the world have a beginning and end time. And the way we, you go, you know, the markets closes or begins is there's sort of an auction for the opening price of the day or for the closing price. Ah, okay. And so people are bidding in the auction for what the opening price should be at like 930. Before and it then opens. And the market trades continuously before it opens. And that's okay, the okay. price it starts at. And then people can fill the order book based on that. Um, interesting. And one interesting hmm. thing was like, I had noticed like different, exchanges I was trading on had like very different designs. Uh, and I was just trying to understand like how, I mean, this is one of the reasons I, I like didn't like working in trading. A lot of times the people around me would just be like, oh yeah, that's just the way, that's just what the spec was that we got for like why it works. And I would always just be like, why did they choose that auction? Like what's the history that we went into like Urex using some weird Dutch auction, but like the CME having just like an ascending auction whose clearing price was like some random pr or reserve price was like some initial price earlier in the morning. They have some sort of like notion of overnight trading, but it's like a, a it's a different instrument technically. Hey. Um, and so I just like never really understood how those were chosen and whether they're manipulable or not and how to reason about their properties. So my journey had started then. And then I think once I had been in crypto, I just observed that, you know, yeah, transaction fees are basically a certain type of auction and MEV was a certain type of auction. And, and it did feel like it was much more reasonably designed than the ones that people were sort of using in finance or even maybe the spec market. These like legacy systems? Yeah, I think the ones in finance, like because they work well enough, people are just like, yeah, whatever, they're fine. Mm. And also there's a centralized entity running it. So you don't even have a choice. It's just like, this is the auction that you use. Whereas I do feel like in crypto, there's this idea that like, hey, you could always make it better. I don't know that nerd sniped me. That's maybe the, the long, long story <laughs> short. Or short story long. <laughs> Going back to that kind of time though, or like just that system in traditional markets, the fact that it's built this way, do you think like have the actors working in those systems developed all of their strategies around it? So it's not only the centralized entity that would need to change, but like everything built around it would need to change. Is that also what's potentially holding it back? Um, I think, it, yeah, certainly the participants who become good at it obviously are entrenched with into not changing the auction format. But I also think there's um, there's some legal requirements for different types of assets for like how things should clear. So for instance, um, indices, like if I trade the S&P 500 or I trade the FDAX in, or the, in, in Europe or, you know, something like that. Indices trade overnight, but the overnight products are actually sort of like futures on the opening auction price. Mm. So you're trade, you're kind of guessing what the opening auction price is, and if you hold it to the opening auction, you can convert that future into real asset at the opening auction price. Mm. Um, they're sort of the sellers of the opening auction, the futures holders. But like single name stocks don't have that, right? So it's like if I you know go and buy tesla or something there's not an auction for tesla stock individually uh oftentimes but there might be for you know options depending on how the day how much liquidity there is so there's some regulation on the index auctions versus like single name things and and it, that part is very complicated and encumbered by history not not due to mm. like mechanism design that was just like this is just the way these markets evolved and that's it. And so <laughs> I think like crypto gives you a new way of actually kind of getting to outcomes for solving the same problems, mm -hmm. but maybe using more well-designed techniques. Do you think there was even an intermediate step between the kind of traditional ones and crypto? And the reason I say this, I know before, just earlier in this episode, I just said that I first kind of understood auctions with the ICO stuff, but actually... I just remembered once upon a time worked around like marketing and ad tech. I didn't do ad tech, but I was like aware of what it did. And over there, there's a ton of auctions, right? That's like it's digital. 
So it's not dealing with like stocks and opening, you know, it's not that much legacy. I think this is, I mean, I'm guessing this is like 15, 20 years old, a lot of that stuff. So would you call that sort of the intermediate step? Like it, does that, does that make sense that it would be like that? That was sort of a place where some sort of the experimentation that might get used in crypto today might have started. Sort of, um, you know, like or is the it such a different product? <laughs> no, no, no. So, so like at a very high level, and I think hopefully we talk a little bit about the Google antitrust case because it's related to this. At a very high level, the auctions for online ads are extremely high dimensional, but very sparse. And what I mean by that is, when you bid on Facebook, you're bidding on a category, a category meaning like female, London, buys lots of clothes, <laughs> drinks green smoothies. Who is this person? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just making up, I'm making up attributes, right? But, but okay. there, there, there's yeah, yeah. categories, right? And there's sort of like a set of these kind of tags, that's, and there's a huge number of them, right, for, for different cohorts of users. And each cohort is its own auction. Right. So Ooh. like you can bid on that cohort and send yeah. and send that. And so you have this huge number of auctions, possibly like exponential in the number of users. There might be even more tags than users. Oh wow. Um, but there are very few auctions that are active at any particular time because there's only like certain cohorts that are using the product. Right. So that's what I mean by mm -hmm. sparse. That's very different than the finance auctions, which are extremely continuous and dense. Like there's many people concentrated on just bidding on like what the S&P 500 should be when it opens. Yeah. Right? And NEV is sort of a mix of the two of those. Interesting. Uh, but the interesting thing is, like, people really invented a lot of the automated market-making literature in the late 2000s. I mean, I guess they, it sort of existed early 2000s, but, you know, I'd say there was, like, a big fervor for it around the 2010-ish. And a lot of that was done at, tech companies because people had thought maybe over optimistically that people would be doing these like high dimensional ad auctions in automated market makers. But then people proved all these really like sad impossibility results. And then people kind of gave up on automated market makers and then crypto people accidentally figured out yes. a different way of doing it. Right. So uh, I, I'd say there's definitely a very interesting connection where the online ad world is the middle ground, but then the online ad world, as sort of some of the Google case shows, it is a bit gerrymandered because people aren't even making their own bids, right? You can't even control your strategy. Like Google oh. executes your strategy for you. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so it wasn't really like a fair market, unlike say at the MEV market. Interesting. So now let's start on the history. I mean, we've kind of touched a little bit about it, but like let's cover the history of auctions in the blockchain context. Do you know kind of where this starts? Like I said, the where I first saw it was in 2017 for these kind of ICO token sale type things. But yeah, I don't know if either of you or if any of you are actually aware of earlier cases and what those look like. Yeah, so it's actually auctions start very early in the Bitcoin paper, right? So Nakamoto, when he's, he's already thinking that he's going to have way more interest for actually sending transactions in the Bitcoin network than actually would have spacing blocks. Oh. So he proposed the use of a first price auction to actually sell that space in the market. So auctions have been around since the beginning of blockchain. Are the fee, like the Bitcoin mining fees built like auctions actually then? Yeah, so the transaction fees are exactly bids on a on an auction uh, in, in okay. Bitcoin. I think the transaction fees were, were a bit, in fact, a bit on a first price auction. It's basically the same concept where in the blockchain space, we just call transaction fees, but in mechanism design, we call them bids. Okay. Actually, continue that story then. Where do we next see kind of examples of auctions? Yeah. So then I would say with the rise of I, uh, the initial coin offering, so auctions have been used to... As far as I know, that was the second use case for auctions, where it's actually how you uh, start a, a new market around a new coin. Um, even more recently, we have seen NFTs, which are another example of a resource that is scarce. And, and auctions are an ideal case on how you can actually allocate something that's scarce. Uh, and you don't know how much, how much you should price it. 
Uh, so, so that's I would say that's the second use, the third use case. After so, the first one would be Bitcoin transaction fees, and uh, then the initial coin offerings, and now we have NFTs, where auctions are very important actually to how you allocate and sell NFTs. And I guess MEV. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> In the early days of Bitcoin, there were definitely also a lot of like off-chain auctions that were settled on-chain. So like there were auctions denominated in Bitcoin off-chain, effectively centralized, but then they were settled in Bitcoin. And I think that was one of those times people were like, I wish we could actually write the auction as a in Bitcoin script, but like people mm -hmm. then like could never quite do it. I, I, I do sort of remember there being an auction, an NFT auction on Bitcoin for one of those like rare Pepe type of like very early proto NFTs, but it was like a weird auction. And I don't think it was like first price or Dutch. It was like sort of some weird thing where like you would post your bids to the blockchain. And then like, there were a couple instructions that would like pick which bid to, to take, but it had a maximum size of the number of bids and people were DDoSing it or DOSing it. I, I, I just remember reading about this, but I can't remember where, whether it was like rare Pepe's, which is like this like early Bitcoin NFT type of thing or yeah. something else. But this was like 2014 where people tried to implement auctions and it like didn't really work on Bitcoin very well. <laughs> I'll just say one more thing about the history of these auctions, um, which is that uh, in all three of these examples of uh, sort of uh, the block space on the Bitcoin network or ICOs or NFTs, the kind of item that you're selling in all three of these contexts are, are very different. So in the context of the Bitcoin network, you're selling something like, what should one unit of space on the Bitcoin network be worth? And that's the scarce resource that you're trying to price. In the ICOs, you're trying to price something like, what should these, you know, I have this batch of sort of fungible tokens, and I'm trying to understand what should what should those be valued? I don't know what their value is. I'm trying to discover their value over time. In the context of an NFT, you have one single item whose value you're trying to figure out, or like a batch of you know replicas of single individual items that you're trying to figure out. And these are sort of very different kinds of, uh, of say, products that you're trying to price. Uh, and it's sort of, it's uh, you know, I, I find it remarkable that sort of the same auction theory helps you price all three of these different, very different kinds of products. So like oh, the scarce block space, these fungible tokens, and these, you know, non-fungible sort of very unique products that, uh, that you can sell for, you know, different prices. Yeah, that's just a little bit more on the history of these auctions. Cool. So I want to go back to something that Tarun just said, this first price and Dutch. I want to understand each of these and how they relate. So let's start with this first price. What is a first price auction? Yeah, so, so roughly uh, auctions can be sort of split up. Is there one way of splitting up the space of auctions is are they something called open outcry or are they are sort of public auctions or are they private auctions? So okay. in public auctions, you know, there's going to be some kind of a uh, open outcry process. Either the auctioneer is going to be saying what the price is at any given moment mm -hmm. and or the bidders are going to be saying what their bids are at any given moment. And this is sort of the classic one where people have signs and they put up right. like, I bid this. And then they're like stamping. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Or it's private, in which case uh, the bidders are going to submit some kind of bid to the auctioneer in a sealed kind of format. Okay. And uh, and those bids may or may not get revealed afterwards. The price may or may not get revealed afterwards. Uh, and so English auctions are sort of, uh, they fall in this kind of, in this open outcry kind of format. They've been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, and roughly they're a format in which uh, the, the, the seller is going to ask every buyer at every time, hey, do you want to remain in this auction? If you want to remain in this auction, you have to raise your bid by at mm -hmm. least some amount. Um, and so he goes around asking everyone this. And, you know, this is a fine process that people have been doing for a long time. It's like poker, I just realized. Right. <laughs> yeah, like, do, do, is poker do, a form do, of do, auction? Oh, do you man. want to raise or fold, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and, and so this is in contrast to these first price, sort of usually first price sealed bid auctions in which the bidders are now going to, so there's going to be sort of one pro, like sort of a one round process for getting the bids to the auctioneer. So everyone submits sort of these sealed bids via some kind of, you know, they have some phone call with the auctioneer. This is how they still do these auctions at 
I don't know, uh, when they do these art auctions at Christie's or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and they're going to submit their bids and the auctioneer is going to decide who the winner should be. And in a first price auction, the auctioneer decides who the winner is. And he says, the highest bidder, the highest bid that I got, that person wins. Mm -hmm. And they have to pay that same price. Mm -hmm. And they have to pay the highest price. This is in sort of uh, contrast to other kinds of auctions uh, in which that's not the rule, uh, in which the rule is something like, the highest bidder still wins, but he has to pay the price that the second highest bidder bids in the auction. And these are called second price auctions. Okay. Yeah. Auction theorists are not, the, 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 their naming was very like, <laughs> yeah, it was very simple. But Did they ever do the average? Somehow the, the, to the top person gets to pay the average? I guess that would just cause the weirdest incentives. People would just go higher, higher, higher. They'd never have to actually pay it. So, so there are these things called all, all pay auctions in which whoever wins the item pays, but then the losers also pay, like everyone pays. Oh, <laughs> they and, just don't get uh, anything. Right. And they, they don't get the item. So, uh, yeah, so there's all sorts of variations on, you know, what, what kind of pricing rules you can have, what kind of allocation rules you can have, but roughly the, the space of auctions can be sort of, in, at least in my head, gets divided up into these either private or open outcry, either first price or second price if they're private, uh, and then either English or, and coming to the sort of title of this work, Dutch. Yeah, Dutch, okay. Uh, but one other thing, and I think maybe Matthias might be a, a good person to, to discuss this, is the notion of, of revelation, um, of like how participants in an auction reveal their preferences. Because like all, we have all these different mechanisms, but it, they all kind of are meant to capture different forms of revelation, like direct versus indirect revelation. And I think like explaining what that is is probably also mm. worthwhile because that's sort of, you know, what's the point of an auction that's supposed to elicit people's preferences and then, you know, allocate to the people with the highest preferences. But, you know, there's not a unique way to determine the highest preference. Yeah, there's a concept in auction theory called the revelation principle, which basically says that any auction that you could, like if you have a complicated auction where it involves a very complicated communication between bidders with the auctioneer, the revelation principle says that if you want to maximize revenue, then you can actually just consider auctions that request bids from bidders. So it's basically saying you don't really need to have a lot of complexity on the auction because if you want, if you're going to maximize revenue, you could just have a mechanism that re requests for bids. Uh, what's very interesting for me though is that if you look on the proof of the revelation principle, it actually assumes that you need to trust the auctioneer, right? So the revelation principle doesn't hold the auctioneer could manipulate the auction because you could have an auction that's credible and the revelation principle transforms it in an auction that's, uh, that simply requests bids, but that result auction might not be credible. Although the initial auction was credible, the resulting auction after you apply the revelation principle might not be credible because it, in the proof it really requires this assumption that you trust the auction year. Mm. Uh, and that I, that I would say that's one reason why, even though you have the revelation principle, you might still be interested in on trying to understand other types of auctions in practice. Interesting. Is first price English? Is that is it because it was from England? I guess there's sort of this strategic equivalence between these dynamic ascending, like the English auction, and uh, actually the second price auction. Okay. And the Dutch. So, so I'll, I'll say a little bit about this this, this Dutch auction uh, because the format's kind of interesting. It's basically the, the the flipped version of the English auction. So, in the, in the English auction, the auctioneer is going to query everyone mm -hmm. and ask, like, "Do you want to raise your bid? If so, raise it by this amount. If not, you're out of the auction." Yeah. The Dutch auction is actually the auctioneer saying, "Hey, I have this price that I'm willing to sell this item at at this moment." And in the next time step, I'm going to decrease the price by some amount, right? And he asks, he, he basically gives the, uh, the buyers sort of an option, which is, do you want to buy at this price or not, right? Like, do you want to buy at this price? If, 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 if you want to take the item, if not, I'm going to decrease the price. 
And you'll see sort of there's there there's sort of a difference in just uh, I, I think Mateus was talking about the communication complexity or the kinds of communication that the auctioneer needs to have with the with with the buyers. And in the English auction, the the, the seller needs to actually quer go around and query everyone. Right? He needs to like ask everyone, "Do you want to raise your bid? Do you want to raise your bid?" And this, as you can see, this can be very expensive if there's a large number of buyers. If there's like too many buyers in the system, then you have to ask everyone what their what their new bid should be. Mm. They want to stay in the auction, as opposed to these Dutch auctions where you can simply it's like you're I'm just like posting a price and I'm saying like, hey, it, do, does anyone want to buy it at this price? Uh, and for that reason, these Dutch auctions are sort of, e even though there is this equivalence between English auctions and second price auctions strategically and Dutch and first price auctions, from an implementation perspective, these Dutch auctions can be much more, you know, they can be much more efficient. Mm. And I've always understood them also that like they might be better suited if you have, if you want a lot of winners, right? Like it doesn't seem like it's as much this for, you know, highest bid wins, but rather that there's like, a lot of people bidding at the same time, and they're all going to get something. Uh, maybe this is just the implementation that I'm that I'm thinking about, but yeah. So I think these polka dot au auctions, like it, these ICO auctions in the early uh, in, in like 2017, uh, they kind of had this feature that like many early bidders could could get these tokens, and they could get them at different prices that were mm -hmm. sort of going down over time. Uh, but certainly, you can have uh, Dutch auctions in which you're only selling one item. In which case, one person is going to end up getting the item at some price, uh, but that price is going to be decided by this sort of descending auctioneer posting this price at every time and asking everyone if they want to buy it. I want to talk about a few of those early ones that I did see. So one I think you just mentioned was the polka dot one. I think they did something called a reverse Dutch auction, where it was like high and then it went. The price actually dropped over time as more people bid on it. And then I remember seeing. I think Flow did something like that. And also Gnosis, I remember them making tools for this, or they were like building the toolkit to be able to run your own. Do you feel like, was that, I mean, was that just perfect for selling fungible tokens and it doesn't really kind of, you, you'd have to rethink it for things like NFTs? Or do you ever have an NFT case where you're trying to sell, I don't know, 10K of them and you're also trying to find this like medium price? Yeah, so there's this famous... <laughs> use case of these uh like these paradigm art gobbler nft collections that they were trying to sell and they were like you know i i don't know what the right price for these things is i, I have ten thousand of them each of them is like roughly like the other but i don't know i don't know what the price i don't know what the price each one um and so yeah one solution is you dump them all on the market at the same time and you ask who wants to buy these ten thousand nfts mm -hmm. uh you could try doing that. That will probably end up with your NFTs getting sold for you know pennies, uh, yeah. you know, like, for like a fraction of the price that they should get. Or you should you could do this kind of, as you said, this kind of uh, process where you either batch them or you sort of sell them slowly. You sort of release them slowly into the market uh, at sort of these decaying prices over time, right? Like so, roughly, you need to say, hey, I want to find an equilibrium price. I want to find some kind of you know, average price for this for this collection. I don't know what that is. Let me slowly like release these NFTs into the into the world at different at, you know at different sets of prices, and by seeing who buys, I'll be able to get a sense of what the equilibrium price of this of this thing should be. Hmm. Would you call this this concept of gradual Dutch auctions? This is what you mean by that, right? So the, the formally it's it's a sequence of auctions so i start an auction so a gradual dutch auction is like a sequence of auctions that i start one at every time and eat the price of each auction is going to decay like that of a dutch auction okay so i'm like at every discrete time at every like I, every time a clock ticks i start a new auction i see and the price of each one of those auctions is decaying over time so roughly you can think of at any given time in the future I have this portfolio, I have this sequence, I have this like collection of prices of things, of auctions that were started in the past, right? So like I'm, I'm at time 50, I have 49 auctions that were started before me in the past, all at different prices. Uh, and now, depending on who buys, who bought those 49 auctions, or who buys in the 50th auction, I can get a sense of what the, what the price or the, what the value of this item is. I also wanted to say one benefit of a debt auction over say selling the item over a posted like a fixed price is that if you sell the item at a very low price you might create a secondary market and and we have seen cases of nft projects using fixed pricing to sell items 
that clear at a price that's very low. And then the blockchain gets very congested because the buyers, they start selling these items in a secondary market in the blockchain. It just creates this, this very congested environment because now the market doesn't know what the price of the item is. So the benefit of that auction is that you might sell the item at a higher, a closer to the clearing price, which can avoid a secondary market. One other thing, I guess, that I would uh, kind of add to, to what Mateo said is Dutch auctions, even though there's a sense in which theoretically they don't often achieve sort of like the minimum possible amount of communication between the bidder and the auctioneer, they oftentimes have much lower communication. And in a blockchain environment, communication is extremely expensive. Mm. If I needed to, you know, if you think about user interactions, if a user has to repeatedly participate and submit many transactions over many blocks, it's not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, if you think about an ascending auction, if you try to do that on a blockchain, you would, let's say I post a bid of three Ethereum for something, then I see someone else in the mempool posted four Ethereum. Now I have to go post something at 4.2 Ethereum. And that's very communication inefficient. Whereas in the Dutch auction, you have this idea that, okay, at block one, the price is 10 ETH. Block two, the price goes to 9 ETH. Block three, it goes to 8 ETH. Okay, there's like three people who want to buy 8 ETH. Block four, if you go to 7 ETH, there's 10 people who want to buy at 7 mm. ETH. And you, you minimize the num amount of communication. Now, again, that's not a totally formal statement. There exists worst case auctions where Dutch auctions still have a ton of communication but they are on average a lot better. Uh, and, and yeah, that's sort of one of the reasons I think people like using them outside of sort of the strategic uh, reason that Mateus mentioned. Cool. So I guess we've now uh, introduced the concept of Dutch auctions and gradual Dutch auctions. I wanted to talk about this work uh, that I mentioned at the top of the show, this credibility and incentives in gradual Dutch auctions. Tell me a little bit about what kind of area you were focused on for this and what were you doing with this work? The core question at hand here is like what? So we've defined these class of auctions where you know these gradual Dutch auctions where sellers are going to sell, say, some NFT collection over time uh, at these different prices. And and the question is like what are the incentives of the seller in this process, and what are the incentives of the buyer? Or it could also be fungible tokens, by the way. It doesn't have to be NFTs. Yeah. So the question was to sort of just tr try to understand what the incentives of of both parties here look like, mm. uh, and in particular. Do these parties have an incentive to deviate from either the auctioneer running the gradual Dutch auction as he had promised? For example, uh, could he participate in the auction? Could he? Does he have an incentive to like lie in the auction? Does he have an yeah, incentive yeah. to do something in the auction that is you know he didn't he didn't uh, explicitly say earlier? And then do the buyers do the buyers have an incentive to report their truthful valuation? And what we mean by report their truthful valuation here is do they have an incentive to buy at their true values for the items? Or do they, uh, because these auctions are dynamic and happening over time, do they have an incentive to do stuff like holding out, buying now for a chance of buying at lower prices in the future? Mm. Or uh, do they do stuff like buying now at the hopes of, of selling in a, in a secondary resale market if there's going to be some high value buyer that comes later in the auction? So there's a sort of space of incentives for the buyers and space of, you know, these deviations for the seller. Uh, and that's roughly what we what we try to understand. Is there also a chance in this case where like like the buyers would potentially collaborate with one another? Is this ever a fear that they're like yeah, making decisions in another forum in order to sort of corrupt this? There is this sort of notion uh, that's been sort of generically defined in these anytime you're running a mechanism on chain. There's a sort of general, very general notion of something called off-chain agreements, right? Like this idea that you could like, there's some mechanism that you're running yeah. on the chain. And these off-chain agreements could be happening between generically people, what people are interested in, are they happening between the person that's running the mechanism and one of the buyers? So like, is the seller colluding with the buyer? Ooh, but it could yeah, also yeah. be buyers colluding with each other, right? They, they could be colluding to, you know, raise the price of this, you know, it's, like, it, it's sort of difficult. So, so the kind of strategies that you have available in these gradual Dutch auctions, you can't actually raise the price of a, any given NFT. But what you can do is you can artificially make the supply scarce by mm. buying as a group or like by buying as a group and then waiting to sell in a resale, in a secondary market. 
Uh, and yeah, that's something that you definitely have to be worried about. <laughs> you design these things. Maybe let's dig in. What are the, you know, let's maybe talk first about this auctioneer. What, what kind of incentives, how, how are you supposed to balance this? What are you looking for? So the main thing the auctioneer can do even here in this auction is set these prices, right? Set this price curve over time for every, for every, for selling every item. So that's a, that's a strategy. He can like decide what the decay rate of say each, uh, each item is and how many, what initial price am I going to sell uh, each item at over time? And that's what he can do in the context of setting like the actual mechanism. But then there's a couple of other things that he can do. The first thing is, he can participate in this auction, right? He can like he he can be one of the bidders in this auction, uh, and in this case, uh, you sort of have this problem where the auctioneer could say something like, "Let me make the initial supply scarce by say buying up some of the initial uh, initial NFTs, in expectation that I'm going to get some high value buyers later." Who are now going to have a have to pay a higher equilibrium price than they would have otherwise had he not, you know, made these initial items in a some sense disappear from the from the auction at some cost, and so this is sort of the main like deviation that the auctioneer has available, or you can think of it as the auctioneer has some cost for making each item disappear, uh, and by doing so he can extract additional amount of value from the from the buyers that are remaining in the in the auction in the future. And because these buyers are sort of considering what is happening over time, because they have these values that depend on what other people are buying at, because they can see the history of the auction, uh, this turns out to be a profitable attack on these on these class of auctions if you don't set these price scripts properly. Hmm. Did you also look at the buyer side of this? So from the buyer's perspective, uh, it really sort of matters what your model of the buyer is here. So as an example... If your buyer is a person who can simply come into the auction at any given time and he has a take it or leave it offer to buy the items that are currently up for sale and then he leaves and never comes back, it's actually very clear what the buyer should do here. The buyer should just buy the items that match his value or, or you know, or less than his value. So that's what you mm. should do. But if your model of the buyer, and this is sort of where the dynamics of this process are very interesting. If your model of the buyer is something more complicated, like a buyer can uh, come into the auction, see the history of the auction. Of course, he can see the history of the auction, but then also reason about sort of future buyers that might come into the auction. He has this valuation that's dependent on sort of the entire history of the auction. Then something sort of much more complicated can arise where you need to reason about sort of the expected utility of the buyer at any given time over this entire sequence of, you know, of all of potential buyers that could arrive. Uh, both that have arrived in the past and that could arrive in the future. Uh, and that turns out to be sort of the more complicated case to handle. Uh, and of course, there's there's even more complicated models of buyers that we don't consider, which are like buyers that can arrive now, buy or not, see what happens in the auction for a little bit and then come back later. <laughs> and then, you know, like, you know, all of this sort of dynamic arrival, you know, these process models. But as a, as a sort of to get a rough handle of things, you just consider these buyers that can reason about, you know, future arrivals of, of higher low value buyers. Okay. I have two more questions on this one. I don't know that you covered this, but are there other actors other than the buyers and the auctioneers that you ever take into account for this? Like influence from outside third party actors that are like causing some sort of misperception? Like, does that ever factor into these analyses? So I think this is actually one of the one of the benefits of these what what are effectively acting as posted price mechanisms. Like at every time I'm just posting like a, se a, a sequence of prices, is that the prices themselves are harder to manipulate here, right? Or if you're not the, if you're not the auctioneer, if you're not the person that's setting up the mechanism, there's no real way in which I can like give you a different price. Uh, but the, I think the interesting place where this all you know comes up, and this is something we, that we don't consider in this in this paper is what happens in these secondary markets, which is really where if you have some understanding of what could happen outside of... So the place that's outside of this mechanism is the secondary market where these NFTs are going to be sold and resold and you know people are going to yeah. pump and dump and they're going to do all their stuff. And it's almost like, is it if they know that that's a possibility, does that alter their behavior in a way? Right, right. And it okay. should, right? It should, it, it should if you... And so effectively, what, what would happen there is that you would have to 
sort of construct this like expanded game, like this expanded strategy space of things that people can do in the auction itself and also in this sort of external attached game. And then you would study sort of the joint equilibrium, as we say, of the of, of this game. Uh, but I think that's much harder because there the strategy space or like what what the external actors can do can be much larger than what they can do in these auctions. And this is something that I learned from Mateus uh, about auctions because I'm not I'm not an auction theorist by any means, but auctions have this very they're typically ways of expressing very simple desiderata about what you want to happen in mm. you know in, in in a mechanism like these rules of like okay I'm going to post the sequence of prices you can take it or leave it uh, are just very simple whereas what can happen outside of these mechanisms in like a general resale market the strategies there can be very different. For example, strategies there could be collusion. So you could like collude with other buyers. Uh, it could be signaling. So like there's some privileged actor who can signal to everyone, hey, I'm buying this. So imagine you have like Ooh, a really yeah, popular yeah. Twitter account yes. where you can like pump and dump your NFTs. And now you can signal to your followers that like, hey, this thing is valuable. Uh, so signaling is an option. Uh, like direct payments, like bribing people is an option. Uh, and so there's just a lot of stuff that can happen outside of this auction that cannot really happen in the auction as defined itself mm. uh, that I think makes these auctions like relatively simple to follow and, and analyze. Interesting. This particular uh, work and actually it, kind of what you even described with like a secondary market, just in terms of the kinds of things that would follow this, it sounds like you're talking really about NFTs. Is there ever a case where this is also something more fungible? Right. So there are versions of these of these gradual Dutch auctions that work for fungible tokens in which you what you basically do is instead of se setting an item up for sale at every time, you set some fraction of your token supply up for sale at every okay, time okay. and then you try to get a price for that batch basically you try to you know do these batches and try to get a price for that the issue i think with these with these fungible tokens i think is i think they're secondary markets i mean it's sure you can have an initial coin offering or like some kind of you know token offering but then they might trade like really in a liquid fashion back and forth in, in the the daily markets i think Typically, people are like more interested in finding like these daily prices for things as opposed to just the initial price. Uh, I don't know if ICOs are like as popular as they used to be, uh, but yeah, certainly if you're trying to find sort of you, you have uh, fungible tokens that you don't know what they're what what the starting price for these things should be, you can do this sort of batching and selling over you know sequence of times. Cool. You know, let's say I'm a person who wants to sell a bunch of NFTs. There's two ways to do it. One is I just say like, here's 500 things. You can mint them and go wild. And that's basically a first price auction in the mempool mm -hmm. for, for who can be the first one to call the function, or at least the first 500. And then there's a gas war over that. Mm -hmm. And that gas war is a first price auction. And this gets to the fact that like selling many items, especially multidimensional, like items of different qualities, all at once is really, really hard. The complexity of it is, is potentially exponential in the number of items, possibly worse if you care about the sequencing of the, how the items are sold. Another way to do it is to be like, hey, I'm going to sell items one by one, one at a time. And you lose some information when you do that because people can't buy arbitrary sequences. They can't go backwards and buy the fourth auction in time. But there is a sense in which it's easier to reason about for the seller. The seller knows like, okay, I sell, sold something. Someone bought it for a price higher than I thought. Okay, I can sell the next one at a higher price. And this type of sequentiality is like something I think people in auction theory have studied, but have not studied when it was used in sort of these like low communication complexity auctions, like you have to have it in blockchains. And I think as we talk about other types of auctions in crypto, like MEV auctions, in MEV auctions, communication complexity is super, super important. Like you can't, in a way that is almost much more important than in the NFTs and that changes the design. And I think that that's probably the nice stepping off point for talking about MEV auctions. Cool. Let's do this. Let's explore a little bit more. Where, where are auctions and MEV intersecting? How does that work? Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll give a tiny bit of a background on how it actually looks in practice. And then 
then kind of set the stage for Mateus to talk about what it could look like in the future, because if we're being completely honest, the current MEV auctions are kind of shitty, and there's not really any way of getting around that. And mm. understanding why they're not good and how that can change is quite important. And obviously, there's a very big economic fight going on for who who will be in charge to some extent of that. And I think this is where auction design is very important. And taking advantage of ZK to make the auctions fair is even more important. Um, so currently, you know, when, the way MEV works is first Flashbots sort of came around uh, to kind of reduce spam on Ethereum by basically having people bid in an auction off-chain instead of spamming the validators to insert transactions on-chain. And the idea was that like by moving some of the you know, the people sniping each other's bids, like someone saying, I'm willing to pay three, someone saying, I'm willing to pay four, someone saying, I'm willing to pay five. And so all three of those transactions going in the blockchain and two, of, two out of three failing, you instead only post the one that's completed, the one that's at five ETH. And you, you sort of run an auction off-chain, and then the validators agree to the outcome of that auction and use that for the ordering of the block. Mm -hmm. And what validators are really, what people are really bidding on is two things. One is inclusion of a particular transaction and ordering of a particular transaction. So I want my transaction to be included in the block and I always want it to be before or after a particular transaction. Or I want this group of transactions to be executed in order. So for instance, if I'm front running some uh, a sequence of transactions, I might say, hey, put my trade first, then put this sequence of trades after. And you bid on that sequence of transactions. Now, the interesting thing about the space of MEV auctions is that there are combinatorial auctions in the sense that you're bidding on sequences of transactions. You're not just bidding on like, hey, I want my transaction in, right? Like when I'm bidding in, oh. in, in EIP 1559, I'm just saying, hey, I'm willing to pay a gas price. I don't really care where I'm going. Instead, you're bidding on sequences and the set of all sequences is way, way larger. Yeah, it, it changes the candor of the auction. Are you bidding on the sequence or your position in a sequence? Do you still have any sort of selfishness here? Like, are, yeah, I'm kind of confused on what that looks like. So, so you, you, you construct these things called bundles, which are ordered sequences of transactions. So let's say I'm going to front run someone and it's a particular transaction. I submit a bundle that has my transaction first and then their transaction. And I, and you, you can think of it as almost like an order type that says, I'm willing to submit this transaction and pay you this fee, this excess fee that I'm bidding on, only if you execute these two transactions in the sequence together. I see. So that even no matter where it is in the block, I will always be before the other person. Okay. Are there like in reality though, can these be quite complicated where it's not just two transactions that you're trying to like match, but actually like they can be arbitrary size. Okay. And in fact, they can be the whole block. Okay. So wow. um, in the current version of Ethereum, the block builders who are people who propose blocks or people who build blocks that the proposer, who is the person, the proof of stake protocol chooses to make the next block. The, the builders say, Hey, here's a whole block. It's valid. And here's how much I'm bidding for this particular block. And, you know, Ethereum moved post-merge to this model. But prior to the merge, um, Flashbots basically was running something where it's like you bid on the sequences. So now it's sort of people send their orders as bundles to the builders and the builders guarantee them that some execution guarantees. But the long story short is these are actually auctions that look a little more like the ad auctions. Remember how I said they're oh, yeah. in the ad auctions, you have these like many, many possible auctions but actually only a small number of them are active at any time interesting yeah yeah um and so there, there's there's a huge relation but the difference is the ad auctions are run by centralized auctioneers and you you they're trusted parties in some sense yeah. you're making this assumption and we are still sort of making this assumption with flashbots although in the current ethereum case block builders are competitive so anyone can be a block builder so the goal of decentralizing this auction is actually quite important but one thing that's, you know, I think in the traditional auction world, whether it's in normal finance or whether it's in ad auctions that people never cared about was this idea of credibility, which is, uh, you know, you could think of a seller incentive compatibility, which means that the seller is not trying to add fake bids or maliciously reorder transactions or, 
you know, things like that. Because we've in, in those worlds, you just assume that the auctioneer is the auctioneer and they can do whatever they want. There's no real recourse. Of course, this Google antitrust case is the U.S. government trying to give Google some recourse for yeah. manipulating their auction. But I think, yeah, the stage is sort of set with this idea of how do we make these auctions resistant to sellers, you know, the, the seller of, of block space in, in the case of MEV, manipulating it to either censor transactions or change the profit, you know, payoff function of a user. And so I think maybe Mateus might be good to, to talk about credibility at this point. Yes, that brings me to my work on credible auctions where I've been working on that for quite a while now, I think four years. So I had the this work with Tarun and Krishit. Uh, we we are basically studying how could blockchains help us design these auctions that are robust from manipulations by the auctioneer. So I had some prior work where we actually showed that cryptography can avoid some possibility results from economic theory. So there was this very influential paper an economist around 2018, where they show that if you want to design an auction that's strategy proof, where, where bidders have incentive to reveal their bids or the, reveal their value, their valuations, and if you want the auction to be revenue optimal and credible, so if you want all, all these three properties at the same time, they show that the ascending price auction is the only auction that, that could do that. Okay. So we talk a little bit about the ascending price auction. So the problem there is that the communication is very expensive. So in the blockchain context, that would just not be practical to implement an ascending price auction. So in, and then I had the paper around 2020 where I show where you could actually avoid their impossibility result. You can actually design auctions that are communication efficient if you can, if you have access to like basic cryptography. So so the way you should take is that their impossibility result is, is what we call information theoretical impossibility result, where cryptography introduce assumptions that can allow, allow you to avoid that. And, and we show that you can actually avoid the impossibility result and design uh, auctions there, satisfy all those three properties. What kind of cryptography are you talking about? It's what we call our non-malleable commitment schemes. So okay. it's actually a very interesting connection with zero knowledge because zero knowledge proofs are a very important uh, tool to actually design those those type of, of technique or of those design those, that, that type of tools from in cryptography. These constructions, are they influenced by anything else in like the proof of stake or anything like in that in, in sort of consensus, anything else? Or is it is it really just kind of being created for this particular use case? Yes, yeah, so there is this particular use case in the blockchain. So when I start thinking about it, it was more general. So it would be for any any context in general. So in this work with Tarun and Kay recently, we actually showed that you can even relax our some of the assumptions in the paper I wrote before um, by using a blockchain. So in that context, the blockchain here is actually a tool to expand the design space because it you basically show that it, this the blockchain allows us to reduce the space of manipulations that the seller could try to do. Uh, okay. So that was quite interesting because I guess there's like a two step here, right? So the so my work in 2020 was showing that just by having cryptography we could we could reduce the the manipulations of the seller whereby now also introducing a blockchain, we can even reduce the, the manipulation space even more. Uh, so I think that's really interesting here is that yeah, there's actually, is actually seeing the separation of, of the design space, right? By introducing these additional tools that they really expand what can we actually do and how we can actually build these auctions. Yeah, and another way of thinking about it is by adding in particular cryptographic primitives and then making assumptions about the users, like the users are computationally bounded in that they can't break particular cryptographic primitives. You can get around a lot of impossibility results in auction theory. And one of the more surprising things about this paper um, to me was that, you know, you already got this thing where you got around this impossibility result, this trilemma by using non-malleable commitments. 
But the idea that posting the non-malleable commitments publicly on a blockchain reduces the set of possible bad actions the auctioneer can take is quite surprising. It says that mm. like the auctioneer, you, you reduce it so much that the bidders can have wilder bidding strategies. So it's like sort of a trade-off between the strategy space by post, forcing people to post commitments publicly, not just privately, one between each other. You change the strategy space so that the auctioneer can't deviate as much and the bidders can do more complex stuff. And there's this trade-off between the two. And the cryptography media and public posting mediates you know, how much power is on each side in some way. Cool. Uh, the work you're describing there, it's entitled, I'm just going to say it for the listener, uh, Credible Optimal Auctions Via Blockchains. But in that, it also re references this other kind of auction, the Deferred Revelation Auction. Is that significantly different from what we've talked about? Like, should we define that? Yeah, so that is essentially, that's actually the auction I, in my paper in 2020. So that was when I, I created that. And in, in fact, the auction is very similar to a second price. Okay. Where the highest bidder wins the item and they pay the second highest bid. But there is a twist here that we use the commitments to actually try to hide your bid from the auctioneer. So the, you're trying to tie ah. the hands of the auctioneer. So he should not be able to create fake bids without knowing what your bidding is. So that the goal is to, to limit how much he could uh, manipulate um, the, the auction and, and your payment. So one example of how the seller could manipulate the second price auction is that, say, you come to the auction, you bid $10, Alice comes, she bids 5 What should happen is that you should win and pay only $5. But if you can't see, if you can't see what Alice is bidding in the auction, the auction could come and lie and say, oh, actually, Alice bid $9. So now you should pay nine instead of paying five. Um, and there's really no way for you to know if that's happening. Unless you force the auctioneer to post a commitment, whether it's a ZK proof or, yeah. you know, a non-malleable commitment of sort of their bids. Yeah, so by introducing a cryptographic commitment of your bid, say now your cryptographic will commit into $10. Now the auctioneer actually doesn't see your bid in 10. So now if he, he has to, if he's trying to create fake bids, he's going to do that without actually knowing what you're bidding. And that might be very risky for the auctioneer uh, because later on he has actually to prove that you are really the winner of the auction. So he, he might risk sending a fake bid of 11 when your bid is actually 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and he can't convince you that you are the highest bidder if you're bidding 10 and he had a fake bid of 11. And I guess like in the past, the way that this auctioneer would often also be kind of like kept in line was this idea of like the reputation of the auction house or the reputation of the company. Is there a reason that you would say like in the blockchain space, you need kind of more strict cryptographic ways to keep them in line? I guess, is reputation sort of not as clear? Even if you have a reputation, as you're saying, like if you go to a second price auction, like in eBay, let's say eBay has a reputation, but so they're not willing to harm their reputation, right? But if they're, if they're manipulating the second highest bid in the auction, you can't, you can't even tell. Oh, you couldn't tell anyway, yeah. So they, even if they care about the reputation, you're not going to be able to prove they're they are manipulating it. With the blockchain, at least you you can re, you can weaken this assumption of the seller having a reputation because you have a, a contract. Tell me, so the non-malleable commitments are they zkps? Like are are they something else? I'm kind of curious. You sort of mentioned there's a connection point between these two things, but yeah. Yeah. So a traditional commitment scheme, it, it's very simple. The idea is that it's, it's similar to a hash function where you are hashing your bit and you're sending it to the seller. And the idea is that if the hash function is collision resistant, later on, if you say you, you hash, say $10, and later on you have to prove, you have to convince the seller that whatever you had committed to was really $10. So what you do, you reveal 10, and now the seller can compute the hash function at 10. And he sees if those if the hash you send in the first round is equals to the hash he's computing after you reveal your bid. 
The problem with that, though, is that even though a commitment can hide a bit and can be binding, there is this concept of malleability where I might the auctioneer might be able to create a commitment to $9 by knowing your commitment to $10 without actually knowing that you had committed to $10. Hmm. And, and in fact, there's very simple constructs of commitment schemes that are malleable. Like if, if you bid $10, it's very easy to generate a commitment to nine, even, even without knowing that you had committed to 10. And then there's this goal of design commitments that are non-malleable in the sense that you should not be able to, no one should be able to generate a commitment to a value that's related to what you committed to. And one direction to actually do that is to use a zero knowledge proof. So what you do is the following. I want to commit to $10, but if I commit to $10, I have to prove that I know what I have committed to. Why would that be non-malleable, right? Because if, if someone tries to see my commitment to 10 and generate a, a commitment to nine, without actually knowing someone else has committed to 10, they have to prove in zero knowledge that they know that they had committed to nine. But if they don't know that I had committed to 10, then they cannot generate a proof to that. Uh, so that's one direction to build a non-malleable commitments by requiring the person who is committing to prove in zero knowledge that they know what they are really committing to. I think like the NFT auction world has a lot of stuff where users' preferences could be expressed in a way that users can kind of buy collections that they want automatically without revealing all of their preferences and getting front run by the sellers or MEV bots. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, like if crypto gaming is ever to become a thing, I think you need some form of this. Mm. Such that it doesn't just become like MEV bot versus MEV bot, yeah. Which is like almost all crypto games, like you know, like if you, if you think about like Dark Forest versus all these other crypto games, the zk aspect of Dark Forest actually is what kind of makes it harder to make these kind of bots in oh. general, strategy wise. Uh, and I think that's going to also be true for these preferences, expressing preferences in a game, like it being like, oh, I like this type of item in the game, and like this is the strategy I want to execute but I don't want everyone else to know it mm -hmm. versus some something like Axie where it's like you're publicly showing your strategy in hand at all times, always. I basically think that like the blockchain gaming world only works if you can somehow allow people to participate in auctions without revealing everything about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a very weird, <laughs> maybe like too far in the future view, but I, I just don't think humans are going to like playing games that are always just going to be like bot first bot. Right. No yeah. one wants to just be like, you know, un unless it's just like at that point, it's just trading. Right. It's not really like playing a game. And I sort of think like having these kind of mechanisms for revealing preferences without revealing your whole strategy. Is it going to be key to kind of like preserving humanity on the blockchain? Whoa, <laughs> that was bigger than I expected. I was just thinking, oh, wow, it's really cool. It might be in gaming, but like, damn. So the fate of humanity is, is at stake. Yeah. yeah. I guess like in, in a world where everyone is, is talking about AGI, sometimes we also have to think about the other side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was curious about Tarun. Like, what does you mean by like bots, like in, in, in blockchain games? What do you mean like by people using bots to play? So there've been like a ton of games, right? That have these NFTs that, you know, have some, either some value in a game that's off chain or have a resale market and what ends up happening is people just write bots that play the games to harvest particular items and then sell them immediately it's not so different to people having bots in like starcraft or something right but there you have this team of people who are dedicated to trying to remove the bots because otherwise the human players will leave and then like the game you know they can't sell real items to real people anymore but in blockchain games, there's kind of this perverse incentive where the game developers get to pad their metrics by having more bots play the game, right? They get mm. to say like, oh, like our total usage was X or we transferred this many dollars of items. And it sort of also ruins the ability for like humans to play. It just becomes this kind of like only the people writing automated strategies are playing. 
And it's, sort you know, I don't think video games in general, you know, I don't really play video games, but I will say one thing, which I think is true, is I don't think there's ever been a video game that, you know, once computers are a lot better at it than humans, that people were like, oh, yeah, I still like playing it a lot. Mm. And I think that in some ways, blockchain games went the opposite way. They're very bot friendly <laughs> right now. And maybe this could bring some humanity back to them, I guess. Yes. And the bots are always just front running the human players and like copying their transactions and then just ba basically getting the item before them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a very interesting aspect of like humans don't like to be manipulated and feel like some, someone or something's taking advantage of them. I think that's, I think that's like very important as, as you design these applications, like, to make sure that users feel like they they have a chance and they are not like just being played by the person who is designing the protocol or being outmatched by the bots that are just like far yeah. too sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is this is definitely the reason I think like this economics idea of revealing preferences without revealing strategy is somehow key to fairness in in these systems and and i i don't know how else to do it without cryptography it, it doesn't seem possible i like that well i want to say thank you to both of you for coming on the show actually all three of you thank you tarun for also being kind of the co-host and guest for this one um yeah and thanks for sharing with us all of your insights about auctions and the work you've been doing around it thanks a lot for having us thank you very much for having us I'm happy we finally dived into the world of auctions because they're a lot more complicated and everywhere in crypto, no matter how much you want to avoid interacting with them. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks again. And I want to say thank you to the podcast team, Henrik, Rachel, and Tanya. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.